Hey squad, welcome back to another Community Choice video, where my supporters on Patreon get to choose the topic. Today, we're going to talk about the clan of men called the Druidine. Known in the Third Age as the Wozes, or Wild Men of the Woods, the Druidine are one of Tolkien's strangest and most enigmatic peoples. They're described as around four feet high with thick, powerful builds, heavy brows, and broad faces, speaking a secret alien language. Very little information about them is found in the history of Arda, with their most significant contribution being the assistance rendered to King Theoden by Gonburi Gon and his tribe during the War of the Ring. Other than this brief encounter, all that is recorded of the Druidine can be found in a few linguistic notes, some passing references in the appendices, and a handful of essays and stories mostly published in unfinished tales. Nevertheless, what information we do have is fascinating, not only because of the curious character and unusual abilities of the Druidine, but also because they showcase an important, though often overlooked, aspect of Tolkien's imagination. To understand the history of the Druidine, we must first revisit the account of how men arrived in the west of Middle-earth and met the Eldar. Like the elves themselves, the race of men is supposed to have appeared or awakened in a long-lost homeland called Hildorian in the Far East. It is believed that Morgoth or his emissaries infiltrated early human society and corrupted it, causing the hearts of men to be darkened. Distrustful of Morgoth's control and in conflict with other tribes, some men undertook a great journey west, following the light of the sun. They hoped to find a region where they could live in freedom and safety. But instead, they found their way to Beleriand, the physical seat of Morgoth's power and the site of his centuries-long war on the Elves. The men who first arrived in Beleriand and made alliance with the Elves became known as the Edine, a term that literally means second and can technically be used to refer to men generally as the second-born children of Iluvatar. In practice, though, this term came to denote this first group of men that allied with the Eldar in contrast with those tribes who were either in league with the Dark Lord or merely kept their distance. Over the course of their long journey, the Edine had branched into three main peoples or houses, the House of Beor, the Haladin or the People of Haleth, and the House of Marak, later known as the House of Hador. This is a tidy account, but it's far from the whole story. It's important to remember that the Silmarillion and related histories of the First Age of Middle-earth are meant to be based on elven histories, and there's a lot the elves don't know or understand about men, especially in their earliest periods so we have to assume a lot happened that either doesn't appear in the record or else is misrepresented or oversimplified. Thus, even among the three houses of the Edine, there was a good deal of shifting about due to continued migrations, intermarriage, and schisms. Some companies stayed behind in the central parts of Middle-earth, and some who made it to Beleriand turned around and crossed back into Eriador. At the same time, other groups of men were also beginning to move westward. Some were already secretly under the dominion of Morgoth and came at his call, but not all, for the rumor of Beleriand, of its lands and waters, of its wars and riches, went now far and wide, and the wandering feet of men were ever set westward in those days. Their houses were many, and some had greater liking for the dwarves of the mountains than for the elves. One such group, called the Swarthy Men, appears in Beleriand after the Battle of Sudden Flame. While distinct in appearance and speech from the Edine, they were hardly a homogenous group themselves, as the very different choices of the House of Boar and the House of Ulfang demonstrate. It must also be supposed that somewhere around this time, the ancestors of the people that eventually would be called the Hobbits branched off from the other populations of men. Somehow, likely through a similar westward migration, by the beginning of the Third Age they ended up settled in Rovanian along the River Anduin. And finally, we find yet another branch in the reclusive, enigmatic people known by the elves as the Druidine. The Druidine were among the first group of men to leave Hildorian and travel west, a group that included the ancestors of the Three Houses of the Edine, but unlike the others who seemed to be looking to escape from Morgoth and his servants, or were searching for the source of the light of the sun, the Druidine mostly seemed to be trying to escape persecution from their fellow humans. Gondorian historians later surmised that they were the first men to cross the Anduin, and settled along the slopes of the White Mountains and in the nearby forests. Most of them would remain there, but a small number of the Druidine accompanied the second house of the Edine, the Haladin, into Beleriand where they settled among them, living apart in families or small tribes, but in friendship, as members of the same community. A few individuals would make their way into other regions, with some entering the service of the House of Hador. In one isolated note, Christopher Tolkien states, 
It was my father's intention, ultimately, to transform Sador, the old serving man in Hurin's house in Dor Lomin, into a Drug. In general, however, the Druidine kept to themselves, maintaining a certain separation and even secrecy even from the Haladin who were their closest associates. It was obvious that the Druidine were more distantly related to the other groups of the Edine. For one thing, in contrast to their taller cousins, the features of the Druidine were deemed unlovely by the elves, and for another, they spoke a totally unrelated language. Their own name for themselves was Druhu, which the elves adapted into the words Dru or Druoth. However, it was also clear that these people were a kind of men, and moreover, they had a staunch hatred of Morgoth and his orcs that made them trustworthy allies. To recognize this, the elves changed their name from Druoth to Druidine, considering them to be part of the Edine despite their distinctness. These terms later show up in place names such as the Druwaith Yaur, which men would later call the Old Pukul Wilderness, and of course Druidan Forest, the supposedly haunted wood to the northwest of Minas Tirith. After the ruinous final years of the War of the Jewels, only a handful of Druidine remained, and with the other remnants of the Eldar and the Edine, most of them were driven to seek refuge on the coasts. Tolkien includes a note that the Druidine were invited to travel to Numenor with the rest of the Edine as gratitude for their sacrifices during the war. One version notes that this Numenorean population slowly dwindled and died out before the downfall, but another describes how the Druidine slowly began migrating back to Middle-earth after failing to dissuade Aldarion from his trips to foreign lands. The Druidine, who were ever noted for their strange foresight, were disturbed to hear of his voyages foreboding that evil would come of them, and begged him to go no more. But they did not succeed. From that time onward, the Druidine of Numenor became restless, and despite their fear of the sea, one by one, or in twos and threes, they would beg for passages in the great ships that sailed to the northwestern shores of Middle-earth. The last of Numenor's Druidine departed when Sauron was brought to the island. Meanwhile, the Druidine of Middle-earth again suffered persecution, both from the growing number of Sauron's forces and from their former allies. They were driven ever deeper into the wilderness by the arrival of Numenorean colonists and by migrations of people such as the Dunlendings, themselves retreating from the Numenorean's deforestation of Enedwyth. The Dunlendings, ironically, were descended from the men of Brethil who had relied on the friendship of the Druidine in the First Age. Generations later, they would refuse to enter the wilderness of the Pukulmen, reported to be deadly hunters with poisoned arrows who had a hatred of all invaders from the east. When the Rohirrim moved into the region in the Third Age, they too took a suspicious, often hostile, view of the Druidine, considering them to be more a species of animal than fellow men. However, the Druidine's enmity with the orcs proved to be of even greater concern for them, and so when Sauron's armies arrived in Anorian, the inhabitants of Druidun Forest warned Theoden of their presence and offered the Rohirrim an alternate route to come to the aid of Minas Tirith. This assistance proved crucial to the Rohirrim's success, and in gratitude Theoden offered a great reward and eternal friendship. But the Druidine's headman, Gan Borigan, declined, saying that as he doubts any of them will survive, the only promise that appeals to him is the killing of the Gorgun, or Orc Folk, and all he and his people want from the Rohirrim is to be left in peace and to no longer be hunted like animals, which honestly seems pretty reasonable. After Aragorn's coronation, he declared Druidun Forest to be the property of Gonborigon and his people, and stated that no one should be allowed to enter it without their permission. So while even at this point the Druidine were already a dwindled race, there's at least the prospect that their final generations were able to live in relative peace. In a setting that already has dwarves and hobbits, it might seem odd that Tolkien would include yet another distinct population of small, hidden humanoids. And Tolkien is careful to emphasize that while they may share superficial traits, the Druidine are very different from either of the others. The Druidine are similar in height and build to dwarves, but they generally lack beards, boasting at most, in a few men who were proud of the distinction, a small tail of black hair in the midst of the chin. They also lack the dwarves' interest in wealth, architecture, and technology, as well as the dwarven tendency toward pride and self-seriousness. In their closeness to the natural world, wariness of larger men, and generosity of spirit, they more resemble hobbits. However, while both are recognizably strains of men, hobbits and druidine have quite different appearances. Hobbits are essentially scaled-down versions of classic men, whereas the druidine have notably stumpy legs, heavy brows, and eyes so dark that it's difficult to tell what direction they're looking. The laughter of hobbits and of druidine is similarly contagious, but the Druidine have a sardonic twist to their humor and are implacably ruthless toward orcs. 
Compared to hobbits, they are stoic and less likely to reveal their thoughts and feelings. And finally, the most un-hobbit-like trait of the Druidine is that they eat little and drink only water. The material culture of the Druidine focuses on plants, wood, and stone, though they do acquire metal tools from their association with other men and later elves and dwarves. They are apparently very resistant to hunger, pain, weariness, and the elements, living in simple shelters most of the time and retreating to caves only in the worst conditions. When Ganborigan meets Theoden in the foothills of the mountains in early March, he is dressed only in a grass skirt. Though isolated, the Druidine do learn the languages of others, after their fashion, but don't usually teach others their own unrelated tongue. While their lifestyle and technology might be considered primitive, it would be a mistake to doubt their skill and intelligence. They are renowned for carving statues so compelling that they're often mistaken for real people. They also have great talent for medicine, and for poison which they occasionally use on their arrows when hunting orcs. While they lack a written tradition, nevertheless, even in the Third Age, they are able to describe events as distant as the arrival of the Numenorians. When Eomer somewhat rudely questions the Druidine's assertion that the orcs on the road will outnumber the Rohirrim, Ganborigan takes Eomer to task for underestimating him. Wild men are wild, free, but not children. I count many things. Stars in sky, leaves on trees, men in the dark. You have a score of scores counted ten times in five. They have more. Another characteristic that sets the Druidine apart is their mysterious, seemingly supernatural powers. Generally speaking, men do not have much magical ability, and those who do seem to possess sorcerous arts are usually allied with Sauron. And honestly, many abilities that other men might see as uncanny in the Druidine can be explained as natural. The Druidine's woodcraft, combined with their keen senses, particularly their sense of smell, make them extremely good hunters and trackers and give them an awareness of their surroundings that seems inexplicable to others. The Druidine also reportedly had a capacity of utter silence and stillness, which they could at times endure for many days on end. They could also use this stillness when on guard, and then they would sit or stand hidden in shadow, and though their eyes might seem closed or staring with a blank gaze, nothing passed or came near that was not marked and remembered. So intense was their unseen vigilance that it could be felt as a hostile menace by intruders. While this is somewhat more impressive, it must be admitted that there's nothing inherently magical about being able to stand really, really still. But the most singular of their rumored powers, and the hardest to explain, is what is claimed about their watchstones. As I mentioned, the Druidine have always been known for their skill in carving. They delighted in carving figures of men and beasts, whether toys and ornaments or large images, to which the most skilled among them could give vivid semblance of life. In addition to marking the borders of their lands with lifelike sculptures of screaming orcs running away, which is hilarious, they also marked the entrances and important junctures of roads and paths with likenesses of themselves. These were known as watchstones, and Tolkien notes these figures served not merely as insults to their enemies, for the orcs feared them and believed them to be filled with the malice of the Ohor High, for so they named the Druidine, and able to hold communication with them. Therefore, they seldom dared to touch them or to try to destroy them, and unless in great numbers would turn back at a watchstone and go no further. There is a legend told among the people of Haleth about such a stone that supports these beliefs. The faithful stone tells about Agan, one of the Druidine, who becomes friends with a family of the Haladin headed by a man named Barach. Barach's family lives several miles from the nearest village, and when roving orcs start waylaying people in the woods, Agan helps guard their home at night. One day, Agan gets urgent news that his brother is injured and he must travel to help heal him. Barak is worried about his family's safety without their friend around to help, but Agan shows him he's brought a Druidine watchstone to sit beside his house while he's gone. He puts his hand on it and says he's leaving some of his powers in the stone. On the third night after Agan's departure, Barak wakes up to find a pair of orcs setting fire to his house. He's preparing to shoot them when out of nowhere a Drug appears, punches the orcs, tramples out the fire, and vanishes. The next morning, Barak finds the remnants of the fire, but no sign of the orcs or the watchstone. And later that day, Agan returns. Barak tells him his story, and after looking around himself, Agan finds a trail that leads to a thicket, where they find the watchstone sitting on top of a dead orc, its legs cracked and blackened by fire. Then comes the twist. Agan removes his boots and shows Barak his own blistered legs, reporting that he felt them burning in the night. The story ends with Agan saying, If some power passes from you to a thing that you have made, then you must take a share in its hurts. A principle that Tolkien immediately noted was reminiscent of Sauron imbuing the rings with his power, among other phenomena.
Now, the tale of the Faithful Stone is related as a legend, and between the orc's superstitious fear of the Watchstones and the ability of the Druidine to remain vigilant even when standing as still as statues themselves, it's easy to imagine how such stories might have evolved even if the Watchstones don't have quite the degree of magic power they're rumored to. Regardless, they are an important part of the Druidine's woodcraft, and it seems such stones survived into the Third Age. Mary sees some along the road to Dunharrow, carved in the likeness of men, huge and clumsy-limbed, squatting cross-legged with their stumpy arms folded on fat bellies. Mary gazed at them with wonder and a feeling almost of pity. The Rohirrim call these statues Pukul Stones and pay little attention to them. But when Mary later sees Ganbori Gan, he notices a strong resemblance. Suddenly, he remembered the Pukul men of Dunharrow. Here was one of those old images brought to life. Or maybe a creature descended in true line through endless years from the models used by the forgotten craftsmen long ago. So, while the Rohirrim do not make the connection between the Pukul Stones and the Wild Men of the Woods, it seems likely that these images are watchstones, very like the ones the Druidine employed in Beleriand centuries ago. The Druidine might seem like an odd or even unnecessary addition to a world already populated by diverse strains of elf, man, and dwarf, and this is especially true when you consider how comparatively little we know about them. As mysterious and outlandish as they may be, though, they do seem to fit, and I think this might have something to do with Tolkien's inspiration, both for the Druidine and for Middle-earth generally. The Rohirrim sometimes call the Druidine by a word Tolkien translates as woeses, a word borrowed from Middle English that referred to a mythical creature also known as the Wood Woes or Wild Man of the Woods often depicted as a naked, savage, hairy human that lived in the forests and was distinguished from ordinary men by his lack of civilization. Such figures are common in folklore throughout history and across the world, and it seems clear that in one sense the Druidine were Tolkien's reimagining of the Wood Woes, just as his Eldar and Khazad correspond with mythic accounts of elves and dwarves. But another comparison that I could not escape was the similarity of the Druidine to what we guess about prehistoric hominid species. For example, here are some descriptions of Neanderthals, first discovered in 1829, from the Smithsonian's website. Some defining features of their skulls include the large middle part of the face, angled cheekbones, and a huge nose for humidifying and warming cold dry air. Their bodies were shorter and stockier than ours, but their brains were just as large as ours and often larger proportional to their brawnier bodies. Neanderthals made and used a diverse set of sophisticated tools, controlled fire, lived in shelters, made and wore clothing, were skilled hunters of large animals, and also ate plant foods, and occasionally made symbolic or ornamental objects. Neanderthals and modern humans belong to the same genus, Homo, and inhabited the same geographic areas in Western Asia for 30,000 to 50,000 years. The physical, cultural, and geographic descriptions and the relationship to Homo sapiens all seem highly reminiscent of the Druidine's place in Middle-earth. We know that Tolkien was interested in tracing historical events through the evolution of language and legend, and some of his inspiration for Middle-earth was the product of him imagining how real historical events could have been interpreted and recorded in such a way that they would eventually produce the words, beliefs, and half-remembered stories of later fables. Another example of this in Middle-earth is the presence of almost prehistoric animals, including the pterodactyl-like winged mounts of the Nazgul and the oliphants that are described as being more like mammoths than like modern elephants. There's also the catastrophic flood that destroys Numenor, which has parallels in folklore the world over that some believe could have been inspired by actual flooding at the end of the last ice age. Middle-earth is rightly considered a work of tremendous creativity and originality. But to overlook the role that history, archaeology, and even paleontology played in firing Tolkien's imagination would be just as much of a mistake as ignoring the role of myth and folklore. The synthesis of the figures of legend with more modern discoveries is what led to the evolution of Middle-earth as we now know it, and as one of the most singular expressions of that synthesis, the Druidine provide a remarkably clear glimpse into the different components that give Tolkien's later fiction its distinctive air. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button harder than a Druidan watchstone hitting an orcish arsonist. For more videos like this, consider subscribing. And to hear more musings inspired by the Druidan, including thoughts on Proto-Indo-European, C.S. Lewis's space trilogy, and yet another half-baked orc origin theory, you may want to check out my Patreon where I'm planning to post those. A link can be found below. Thank you to everyone for watching, and especially to this channel's supporters, including Chris Nichols, 
Jeremy Buckingham, Bits Obongo, Dorwin Gray, John Love, Brendan Mooney, E. Rose B., Allison Kreutzberg, Frankie Twelvestring, Louis Maskell, Tamara Saldana, Luke, Karen and Michael Donahue, Kevin Gilstad, Joel Bion, Rogue Hot Pocket, Elu Thickgoal, and Jared Carver. <laughs>